Um, so I'm Ryan Dennis. Um, I'm the curator and the programs director here at Project Row Houses and very excited to have the opportunity to organize this day with really exceptional um, people who work in my orbit and work in the field of um, the intersections of art and justice and um, historic preservation. Um, so this panel um, that we are having this afternoon um, is titled Beyond Social Practice. Um, the panel will look beyond the label of social practice and present an opportunity to address issues of race, class, gentrification, and displacement. The conversation will be centered on utilizing creativity, imagination, and en engagement to consider how we hold space for artistic production that honors memory, people, and place. Um, I'm really thrilled um, that all these magical people could be on stage to discuss these ideas. Um, and hopefully, um, because G is brilliant, we'll bring um, together the conversation that we had earlier in addition to what Lisa spoke about. Um, Gia Hamilton is our esteemed moderator who will guide this conversation. And so I'm gonna give a little introduction about Gia and then she will um, briefly introduce the panelists and each panelist will um, present for a few minutes. So Gia is an applied anthropologist who employs social magic methodology to investigate land, labor, and cultural production while examining social connectivity within institutions and community. As a model builder, Hamilton co-founded an independent African-centered school, Little Moors, in 2006. Later, she opened a creative incubator space, Grigri Lab, in 2009, and led uh, the Joan Mitchell Center Artists in Residency Program in New Orleans. As the center's director, Hamilton led the development of a two-acre campus capital project and designed the program as a place-based community-centered laboratory for visual artists, curators, and the creative community with the belief that imagination and creativity are paramount to creating a more equitable and just society. Hamilton received her bachelor's in cultural anthropology from NYU. New York University and Master's in Applied Anthropology from City University of New York's um, Graduate Center. She is on the board of Tulane University Newcomb Museum, the Alliance of Artist Communities and New Orleans Video Access Center and Museum Hue. Hamilton recently received the next City Vanguard Fellowship and was nominated for a City Business Woman of the Year Award. Gia currently lives in New Orleans with her four sons and just completed an ethnographic memoir entitled Modern Matriarch. Please um, join me in welcoming this panel. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I want to um, just share, it's, it's always really uncomfortable to have your bio read in front of groups of people, so I just want to acknowledge um, that we are really sitting here in a group of people who are um, just really rooted in purpose work. Um, and I wanna just start off a little bit different by having us take a collective breath. Um, I think that the work and the conversations that we're having are uncomfortable, um, are important. Um, and so it feels important for us to kind of enter into this conversation just with, a, with some form of bringing the circle together. So if you all will just indulge me a little bit as we just all sit and take a collective breath together. So. Great. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So I'm gonna read a quote, um, and it's actually, it's actually a quote that's on uh, a little notebook that I picked up, but it's a quote that I'd heard over and over again that, uh, really resonates with me and, and I think will resonate with the people that I'm sitting next to. Um, it's from Shirley Chisholm, um, and the quote is, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I bring this up because I think that artists are continuously in a position in which they are bringing folding chairs to the table, right? Um, and then sometimes have to dance on top of the table, uh, get under the table, and just do all sorts of things to de deconstructing the table and rebuilding it. Um, and I, I'd like for us to think about 
the role of artists in that way, right? As shapeshifters, as, um, as people who are constantly moving and changing. And I think we're gonna hear um, three different experiences, um, three different ways of thinking about place-based work, thinking about uh, cultural and arts production. Um, and then we're gonna get into some questions, some that are about um, success stories and others that sort of really unpack uh, the difficulties and the challenges that we're currently facing. So the first person that I want to bring up is Chicago-based artist and cultural worker, Jen Delas Reyes. Can we give her a round of applause? All right. Thank you so much to Ryan and the Project Row Houses team for the opportunity to be here. It really is an incredible honor Project Row Houses has been an inspiration for me and I know countless others. I want to start by saying why it is that I do the work that I do and why it matters. The social role of the artist is crucial in building dialogue, communities, and understanding. Part of what art does is to help us understand the world around us and imagine new ways of being. Artists have the power and the potential to be world builders. We can create intricate universes through our works of art and invite others in. Artists can be visionaries, seeing possibilities and ways of doing that many others cannot. Artists can be leaders, fearless in establishing new genres approaches and theories. Art can be healing and community building. It holds the potential to connect us to emotional landscapes and each other. Art has social implications, impact, and value. This is something that I understood as a young punk in high school. That's a picture of me on the skins. Music was a way to build a scene and community. It was also how I learned to organize, self-publish, and collaborate. In art school, my work centered on relationships and the challenges and struggles of working together. By the time I got to grad school, I began thinking about the wider implications of socially engaged work and began to notice that there was a critical mass of artists working in this way. I met artists from all over the world doing this work. I learned the histories and the legacies of artists like Joseph Boyce. He believed that life is a social sculpture that everyone helps to shape. Meryl Laterman Eucles and her notion of maintenance art and the path that she created for herself as the official artist in residence with the New York City Department of Sanitation for the past 40 years. Suzanne Lacey and her issues-based community awareness performances group material and their collective approach to public dialogue and public art. Rick Lowe even came to my school in the middle of nowhere on the prairies of Canada to talk about Project Row Houses. I was learning firsthand as an artist, academic, and cultural producer why this work matters, and I wanted to put my energies towards supporting it. Canada has a long and rich history of artist-led, run, and supported culture. I made a choice as an artist to make my work about creating a site of care for those involved in socially engaged art. In 2006, I began work on what would become Open Engagement. Open Engagement is an artist-led initiative. It's a project that is committed to expanding the dialogue around and serving as a site of care for socially engaged art. We highlight the work of transdisciplinary artists activists, students, scholars, community members, and organizations, all working within the complex social issues and struggles of our time. 
Since 2007, OE has presented 10 conferences in two countries, six cities, hosting over 2,000 presenters and over 8,000 attendees. In addition, we managed a publishing arm, assembled a national consortium of institutions, colleges, and funders, all dedicated to supported, supporting artists engaged in this necessary and critical work. I knew that as an artist, creating this site would be more meaningful than any one project that I could take on. Part of my work in supporting these practices is also educating artists to do this work in the world. For eight years, I served as the chair of an MFA program in art and social practice at Portland State University. During my time there, I created the first low residency MFA program focused on socially engaged art, which allowed for artists in their own communities to stay and remain and be able to do the work that they're already invested in. In line with my belief that the social role and work of the artist should not be an area of specialization or an afterthought, I also devised Foundation's curriculum for undergraduate students in socially engaged arts so that this way of working would be taught right alongside drawing, painting, and sculpture. Today, artists no longer need to learn figure drawing or how to produce a color wheel. As artists, we need to learn how to look that is clear. But this looking must reach beyond the page. We need to really see the world around us. We need to understand political spectrums, not just grayscales. We must be able to communicate and connect with a wide variety of people and perspectives, including those that differ from our own. As artists develop their craft and hone in on concepts, we should also focus on context, publics, and social function. Pushing art students to move beyond learning skills that we associate with traditional art making is critical. Understanding that artists need different skills today is urgent. We need artists to navigate social systems, political and legislative structures, to be skilled in nonviolent protest and demonstration, and to understand how to organize creatively in their own communities. This should be the basis of all art education today. As the description of this panel suggests, the definition of this way of working often feels murky with unclear boundaries. It feels porous. For me, this is a benefit. It lets more people in. It allows our work to be expansive and to connect with ideas and people outside of what can often feel like an elitist and isolating art world. I know that for myself, it was the term social practice and socially engaged art that gave me clarity and some acceptance. Unlike many other art world terms, this wasn't something that was coined by a critic or a theorist. It was borrowed from the humanities where it's used to describe a myriad of social customs and practices that we engage in with each other together. The term socially engaged art also feels inclusive, open, and most importantly, descriptive of what it actually is. All art has social implications and value, but socially engaged art describes an ethos and a process. It's a form of art in which the social component is needed for its very existence. Without the people, there is no work. Project Row Houses is an example of that. Because of work like this that has been happening and paving the way for the past 25 years, it's possible to see a group in LA like Public Matters working with national health organizations to address food deserts. It's because of the work that Mira Later Manukulis did as the artist in residence at the New York Department of Sanitation that we can see programs in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Boston, and New York, and around the world where artists are now officially in residence in city departments and agencies. And how the work that Joseph Boyce did to align his art practice with political action made it easier for a generation of artists to creatively link their work and their activism. 
The ability of artists to be world builders, visionaries, connectors is urgently needed. It's what motivates me to do the work of organizing systems to support and create institutional infrastructure and to educate artists to creatively shape the worlds that we want to live in. Thank you. Next, we want to welcome uh, New York-based artist Shani Peters. Hello. We give Shani a, a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, my name is Shani. I'm going to talk to you about um, a collaborative project um, that I am involved with called The Black School. Um, we are still new, about two and a half years old. Um, so in addition to giving you kind of an overview of what we do, I'm gonna share some um, individual work that I've done in the past so I'll kind of give you some context about where I'm coming from and what kind of sort of things I um, and my partner bring to The Black School. Um, this image that we're looking at now is an uh, image from the Black Panther Party's Liberation Schools, which is a chief inspirer of ours along with the freedom schools of the uh, civil rights movement and along with art and our belief that art can and does affect society. Um, the we that I speak of is myself and my partner, Joseph Couillet. Um, and we're here, you can also see our precious little sweet tweet Baldwin in my stomach. <laughs> there, she, uh, she's 19 months old now. Um, so, uh, general overview of what the black school is. We're an experimental art school um, that combines black radical history with public art making. Um, we have the goal of seeing our students leave workshops or workshop series with us feeling ca like capable um, agents of change in their own communities. We begin every workshop um, with the questions, what do you love about your community and what do you want to change about your community? And then we talk, unpack, um, and, and make work from there that is intended to go back into their neighborhoods, their communities, um, and, and affect those issues that they first address through those questions. Um, I also want to just say a little bit about where Joseph and I come from personally. Um, we're both artists um, and then see great capacity and, and have our personal interest in there, in that space, um, but we're also both children of educators. Um, my father's a black studies professor, recently retired um, at Eastern Michigan University in Michigan. Um, my mother was on the school board in Lansing, Michigan, where they raised me. Uh, Joseph's father is a high school teacher and now principal here in Houston, um, and his grandfather um, was an educator and administrator and on the school board um, in the West Bank of New Orleans. So we have this shared interest in the contemporary art world, and we met in New York City in very, another different location from the places that we come, but we have this grounding um, in education, and Joseph's stepmom just walked in <laughs> the room also who works in the neighborhood, Lasting Impressions Dentistry. If you want to support a black woman-owned dentist, all right, third ward. <laughs> so I'm going to share um, some images from some of the workshops that we've done. This is a screen printing, poster making workshop. Um, this is a collage workshop, which was led by a visiting artist, Ariel Jackson. Whenever funding allows, we invite um, visiting artists to come in and teach students to expose students to as many contemporary artists of color, especially black artists, as possible. Um, here you see Tiffany Smith leading a photography workshop. Um, this is a workshop that we did with Parsons Scholars, which is the new school's is high school prep program. This year, um, semester long engagement, we focused in anti-gentrification work and POC solidarity. Uh, this is an image from our first annual Black Love Fest um, last year at the Brooklyn Children's Museum. Um, we're an experimental art school, right? So that means we um, are thinking beyond the classrooms and, and sort of commonly understood notions about what school is, what education is. Um, we're really looking in a holistic way and wanting an entire community to feel a part of the sort of education that we're interested in experiencing collectively. So we want our students' parents to feel just as comfortable with us as our students do, as well as their mom, their aunt, their, their little baby cousins, right? So every year we put on a festival 
um, that really brings in that whole audience, and we hope to expand this type of programming as we grow. Um, we invite musicians, live performers, DJs, other artists. Um, in the second festival, we were able to invite more than three times as many artists to come and do projects that are similarly public, that are um, similarly rooted in this concept of black love, and really just to elevate that sentiment of black love, um, not romantically, but community-wide and, and nationwide, right? Anyone who loves black people is encouraged and invited to the festival. Um, so beyond tolerating blackness, beyond accepting that our lives you know, should, should not be ended, how about we actually love black people and all the contributions that we make to the society? Um, again, we're an experimental art school, so we get to do things like create an installation of an ideal learning space, um, which we had the opportunity to do this summer at the New Museum as summer social justice um, artists in residence. So we created an installation and it ran programming. Here are some screen prints that I made, which are sort of imagined as uh, reimagined classroom posters. And below um, that table houses our um, black school process deck, which I could go on and on about. Um, there's a teaching tool that we've developed in the last year um, as a way to adjust and grow um, from what we learned in our first year. Um, this I wanted to talk a bit about is a view of the main space of the installation and this tent structure that Joseph um, designed. It kind of in the context of the conversation we've been having today, this is thinking about a number of things, one of which being functioning within, in, functioning within an institution, right? And how, as a still mobile school, we go into other people's schools, museums, community centers, wherever there's space and students, and we operate there, but there's always this issue of being inside of another space, and especially in you know, an a internationally renowned museum, the presence of the institution cannot be avoided. So this tent is kind of starting to look at and just paying um, notice and attention to the fact that we are functioning within this other space and trying to create something like a safe space, something like a soft space, something like a private space within these institutions. So that's sort of our folding chair. <laughs> um, we held conversations, meditation, workshops in that tent. You see an image of that to the left. And the student work wall, um, which is now populated entirely with work that was made over the course of the summer. Um, the show is up until the 16th of September, so just a couple more weeks. Um, and then this is our second annual Black Love Fest that we just had on August 19th, uh, this time at the Sugar Hill Children's Museum. Um, I, I didn't mention before that we also use this as an opportunity to exhibit all of the work made by students over the course of the previous year. So those structures show that. And Tiffany Smith has been at both of them and done her amazing photo booth. Um, so a little bit about me, I'll just share a couple of related projects with you. Um, and I thought I'd go like real, um, background, this is actually my thesis exhibition um, from um, earning my MFA at City College of New York, where I'm now an adjunct professor. Mama, I made it. Um, <laughs> so this project, a uh, 10-part video project, is called Reprogram, Episodes 1 through 10. The premise is that it is starring uh, the families of The Cosby Show and The Good Times, and they are inexplicably collapsed as one happy family. Um, by so doing, I'm kind of eliminating that um, class barrier that exists in the black community. Um, and through the 10 videos, they're visited by different members and affiliates of the Black Panther Party um, who kind of take them to, through the 10 points of the Black Panther's 10-point program. For instance, um, Claire calls uh, Stokely Carmichael, a.k.a. Kwame Toure, to ask for help because uh, Theo's just been drafted into another Middle Eastern war and she's trying to get her baby back. Um, not funny at all, in the um, police brutality segment, uh, the family is preparing to go to Sean and Nicole Bell's wedding, um, and they're supposed to go with Fred Hampton and Bobby Hutton, but Fred and Bobby show up instead to report that there will be no wedding because the police have just murdered Sean um, the night before. That incident happened early in my time moving to New York and was very impactful to me. Um, finally, this one I hadn't thought about in a good while, and I really had a moment um, revisiting for the purposes is, purpose of this talk. Um, the education point, um, Sandra and Elvin were bringing their kids, uh, Nelson and Winnie, my daughter's nickname is Winnie, 
um, to their parent-teacher conferences and they had like a very rude awakening of the state of the school and the public school system um, from Laura Bush. She paints a pretty horrific picture. Um, but kaboom, guess who stepped in the room? Uh, Emory Douglas and Erica Huggins um, show up to kind of swoop the kids away and give them um, an alternative education. Um, and I just want to shout out, uh, we, I think we know Emory Douglas's work a bit better um, at this point, um, but I want to shout out Erica Huggins, um, who was chief programmer for the Liberation Schools, um, who served on the Oakland County School Board um, following the Panthers sort of prime. Um, and contemporary, more contemporarily, does things like organize yoga programs for incarcerated people um, in the Oakland County prisons. Um, so finally, I want to talk about a project that I did in 2013 um, that I think will help to um, bridge me showing you something like a sort of isolated studio made video project to the more social engagement um, practice that I have. I'm not somebody that can make work and only see it live in a gallery space. That's fine. It can go to a gallery space. But I need that work to come into contact with people who are reflected in the sort of work that I make, right? My work reflects my experiences. And I need people who understand those experiences to be, be able to see them for me to feel like that cycle is complete, um, which is how I come to doing work known as social practice work. I'm always having to um, kind of create spaces to make this work accessible because we know um, about who is typically um, spending time in traditional museum spaces and who is typically made to feel welcome and who's not. Um, so for example, in 2013, I worked with an organization called the Laundromat Project. I was a resident um, and my project was something called the People's Laundromat Theater, which was basically a small uh, um, film festival that ran out of the laundromat over the course of the summer. I invited other um, video makers of color to submit work. We had a total of 30 artists uh, submitted over 12 hours of video, which looped over the course of the summer. So to the left, you can see how you could watch it while you're you know, washing your clothes. And then this very humble voting system um, was kind of nestled in different corners of the laundromat where people could vote and comment. Um, we held workshops really as a way of having opportunity to just sit down and talk to people about this strange thing that was happening in their laundromat, um, but also as a way to like unpack some of the themes um, brought up in the work um, as a way for artists to be able to come and see the project and be able to talk to the people engaging with it um, and all kinds of other things that I'll not touch on because I don't want to go too far over. Um, the project was concluded with a uh, red carpet finale, which had the theme that everyone is a star and everyone is a VIP. Because we were kind of doing this video film festival thing, I wanted to reference um, the celebrity culture that is so pervasive um, and celebrity kind of obsession that's so pervasive in our um, culture and bring that back um, to the local level and kind of um, help people to um, feel on that same level um, for a night. And most importantly, um, we watched the five most um, popular videos of the summer as voted um, through the community voting system. Um, so I hope, I hope I've given a, a good sense just by talking about the work. Um, and, and I think we'll kind of answer more questions specifically in conversation. Thank you. And, and finally, we'll, we'll shout out Houston and bring up Houston-based artist, Nathaniel Dunnett, who is going to talk a little bit about his practice. Nathaniel. Houston. OK. Um, thanks for coming. And um, I just got to say that uh, coming after all of these brilliant women is like maybe Lil Wayne trying to sing after Aretha Franklin. <laughs> so all I could do is just let the energy, you know. That's all I could do. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm going to start off. So uh, that's my name. Okay, so I um, self-identify my practice as dark imaginaries, and I can get into the details of that later, but just going to read this. It's a self-identifying term that describes my multidisciplinary practice, it explores the aesthetic and conceptual relationships regarding the human experience, societal and spatial concerns, 
My practice is rooted in black cultural production, the black American experience, everyday aesthetics, poetics, and the working class. So I also want to do this. I want to see if I could ask the audience to repeat a word that I say. Black. black. Brown. Brown. White. White. So those words have very, very hierarchical meanings when you think about them in terms of social and society. And uh, before I start off, I wanted to uh, give a description of what the black spatial imaginary is and white spatial imaginary is. And that's from a writer, well, he's a scholar actually, but he wrote this book called How Racism Takes Place. Um, George Lipsitz. So white spatial imaginary realizes pure homogenized spaces, controlled environments and predictable patterns of designs and behavior. It hides the social problems rather than solve them. On the other hand, black spatial imaginary is always in flux, generates a spatial imaginary that forces public cooperation and solving public problems. So here what you have is um, one space that was created um, in terms of a, a positive perspective uh, given through government and a lot of other things, all of these um, um, benefits. And by default, the other side is the negative. It's taken away. And so what I'm going to talk about is uh, how dark imaginaries, which is my practice, and black everyday aesthetics as framing devices and social inquiry of the spatial. And so it's very important that what, what Lisa was saying about questions, because I'm not necessarily a person that resolves what I ask a lot of questions, and I think we should ask a lot of questions and ask the right questions. So the question for this piece, I'm going, this, this project, and I'm just going through these, these different projects real quickly. Um, Question, blackness as an aesthetic is malleable and improvisational. It moves around depending on its carrier or environment. What serves the idea of blackness? Better memory or physicality? What happens if all physical entities of blackness is removed immediately or slowly over time? How is the idea applicable or symbolic to gentrification? If blackness as we understand it is erased, how is it traceable? Black cultural aesthetics can't stand alone. Memory and action, social political, must stand with it, particularly in low income areas. And um, I put the result here because that's how I kind of measure that, that particular project. So I feel like it was undetermined and open-ended. And so what, what I did was I basically went and collected hair from uh, barbershops, AKA David Hammonds. And I went and inserted the hair in different, um, house, on different houses in Third Ward, uh, area code 77004 as a way to to talk about memory, and it's also a way to, to think about um, an aesthetic. In terms of how I described it, like a black aesthetic is something we look at, something we see, but when it's removed, how do you, how do you define blackness at that point? Which means that blackness is not necessarily just the aesthetic, it's also the things that you do to support it or kind of erase it. So that, that piece, to, that image on the left has, was removed. And that's, that's the space where it is now, it's empty. So if you're also thinking about graffiti in terms of uh, demarcation and, and, and how that you can show pub, you know, private, public, the haves, the have-nots, this is kind of what this indicates. 77004, and I just highlighted basically in this area, residents below the poverty level is 50.7%. And so why is that important? It's important because Income and uh, the, the community is um, affected, well, it impacts the schools, and the schools are impacted by the income and the population. So Ryan Middle School, which is now Baylor, um, is it Baylor something, Middle School, it, the name was changed, and I believe in 2008, the the, the school attendance started dwindling. And so the more people are in, you know, the classes, the more kids, and it's got more, more money comes to the schools, right? So it started to dwindle. And, and the thing was, they didn't actually have a library. 
And so when I found out about that, then that kind of sparked the particular project I'm about to show you now. But just to read it, what does it indicate? Here's a question. What does it indicate about the school education system when a low-income school transforms its library into a storage room and has very little books? Does the community have an interest? How does the economics of the neighborhood play a part? The result, I created an installation. The installation was determined and certain. The books and kids was undetermined because I left that open. And there's no way I could measure how that impacted them. Well, I, I couldn't. So this was um, my, my first installation at Project Row Houses. And as you can see, basically, I turned the row house in, into a store. And the store was a metaphor for um, the way the mind works. Information goes in, there's a process, and then things are you observe, and then you react to those, those type of subconscious thoughts. And I wanted, and that is an exchange in, in terms of visual and action. So what I did was, I, if you look on to the left, the corner right there, I created these small resin fabric sculptures. And I asked the public, and I sent their call out, if you were, um, if you wanted to have one of those sculptures, the visitor would need to bring a book that they read or was inspired by at the age if you were going to that middle school, right? So if you see here, you see the community involvement. It was way more books than this. And so what, what I was deducting is that, you know, it's not necessarily the community not being involved. There's a greater picture that we had to deal with. And that thing is invisible. And so what I'm trying to do in terms of asking the questions is look for the invisible, look for what's not seen. The before and after indicates the segments of the community and those who found out about the project donated books. This is the participatory part. And that is an aesthetic in terms of the human action, right? But then the other part of it is the absence of what actually happened in terms of the books. Second project, question. Uh, it's called What's the New News? Also, uh, Project Row Houses. <laughs> but I started initially in 2011, and they brought it back to life, so thanks. So question, how do you re redirect the value and concerns of representation back to a specific community through form, information, and collaboration with expanded forms of public art that is collaborative? Create something that directly impacts the lives of people in tangible and abstract ways. The result, newspapers, certain response was, was certain, but it was still open-ended. And I also want to insert right here, because I didn't say in the beginning, you'll see that the, 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 the process of these pieces flips from the individual, which is me, not being individualistic, but individual within a collective, like doing the hair, to collaborative in terms of the community, which was a, a project before that. And this one is I invited or asked writers, artists, businesses, organizations, to participate in this project. And I was interested in how, um, well, I was inspired by how do you direct the narrative of your space, right? How do you re respond or be or resistant to a narrative that's created for a community, specifically Third Ward, that really don't visit it and only know the insides, only know the outside, outer sides of it, which is usually towards, leaning towards the negative. So this project was the response to that. Again, it was asking questions, um, not necessarily answering them. So here you see the uh, news racks in front of different uh, the locations. That's Crumville, which is on Elgin. And I, I don't know, this is the Frenchy Fry place, but I forgot what street it's on. I think the Ennis, I think. Ennis, right? OK, so here we have the news racks as a coexisting public art piece, coexisting with the community, right? We also have the newspapers, but the newspapers is informative, and by the way, um, the, the newspapers are inspired by like uh, the black, well, all the black newspapers, specifically in Houston, uh, Four Times, Houston Defender, but also the Black Panther, the Crises. Um, that too is a public art piece. So how do you refine, what do you think what do you think art is, public art is, and all those things is really um, fluid for me. And this is at Shape Center. You see this brother around all the time. Okay, so this is a performance, and this, this uh, thing is amplifying the everyday. 
the everyday being seeing the um, black Muslims on the street giving away or selling the final call newspaper. So it's, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm, this is just a video still of it. And so basically what I was doing is just on Almeda and Southmore and giving away the, the newspapers. The interesting thing was it was really, really hard to give them away until I wrote a sign that said, well, I, said, I thought it said, um, listen to this, free newspaper. You know, it was really slow. Then I put art project. A lot of people started participating then, which was really interesting to think about what those words mean, which you think have, you know, no meaning. We did a youth writing workshop, was led by educator and writer Josie Pickens, and the uh, young people did poetry reading downstairs. Next project, you are the one. Question, what does it feel like to consider an other, be considered an other, should be, or other, what is other? How is one other in institutions and retail spaces? How do you respond and get people to respond? Discriminatory practices psychologically regarding the anti-black spatial and anti-black merchandise. So what do I mean by that? Well, this was a, uh, I did this project in Milwaukee, which they have uh, like one of the highest incarcerated rates for black men. And in addition to that, it was, it was responding to retail stores and the discriminatory practices regarding names, regarding just your black body being present in the space how you are automatically suspicious just because of your race. And also the actual merchandise. You see that shackle? That was actually being sold as merchandise. And so all of those things came to mind. I was like, well, what do I need to do? So I created, I created this um, installation that was um, set up like a retail store. But, oh, and the t-shirts. And then uh, this particular thing responded to uh, respectability pro uh, politics. Y'all know what that is? So, so the older generation is like, why are you sagging your pants? If you sag your pants, you can't get a job. If you sag in your pants, you won't get, those things are irrelevant. Sagging your pants have, doesn't have anything to do with a structural system that is set up to keep you out or keep you at a, 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 a low space. Uh, but, I also uh, put the images of like black leaders to kind of shut them up, and that was that. And so I, I collaborated with teens, teens, preteens, young adults, and seniors, and asked them what they feel it meant to be other. So I created these shirts, right? And it says, "Am I the only?" And they would fill in the blank. So it's a retail, like the retail stores. Now, I'm thinking about space and how that particular uh, Am I the Only Black Person shirt, how it confronts. When you think, when you go back to the beginning, I was talking about black spatial imaginary, white spatial imaginary. That shirt confronts the white spatial imaginary head on. Also created this ad in uh, Art and Culture Texas with the same thing, but a little more localized. In 1950, uh, the artist John Biggers won this award at the Houston Museum of uh, Fine Arts. Due to segregation, he was unable to attend the school, I mean, attend the uh, museum to get the award. So for the ad, I created this piece, and if you look here, this is John Biggers' book, The Upper Veil, Upper Room. And I had a friend and friends, this is the irony here, but I had the friends to uh, create this ad and, 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 and confront that idea, but also thinking about an audience. How do you reach an audience you know, beyond white cube space? How do you reach an audience even beyond the magazine or the t-shirt? Uh, next, next, next. Okay, so I'm also the founder of this uh, webzine blog called Not That But This. And which was talked about earlier, um, if you just read the, read the captions here. Not enough color in American museums. Here. Playing with numbers, black representation in American institutions. So, Tony Marston says, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. So I wanted to figure out how to place us in it, in this conversation. And uh, we have a few websites here that uh, 
that d deal with reviews and everything, but the, the one at the time, I was responding to them for the lack of representation, the lack of reviews, also racial reductionism. And what I mean by that is only reviewing the works through a racial lens and not through the, uh, the subjects, topics, content, material, or whatever. It's just through a racial lens. And that racial lens that they review it through is also limited in, the, in their own scope. So this very, that's a very bad way to uh, represent a city this size, or anybody, really. So I created um, the website, not that but this. Not that but this, right? Not that but this. Not That But This is a Houston-based webzine blog funded by me. It was created out of necessity by artists, writers, and various creatives seeking to showcase and celebrate contemporary art and culture created by people of color throughout the African diaspora. Okay, so now we get into, I'm bringing it back around to dark imaginaries. Now, I, I do this thing called Houston Top Sculptors, and I, I place it on Instagram, on social media, Instagram, and Facebook. And what is it saying? saying a lot of things. Uh, let me read this. Everyday aesthetics and working class poor resourcefulness bring attention to space and also to what we don't see, such as the conditions that created it, back to the black spatial and white spatial, the spatial and spatialization. So when we think about, uh, or when we talk about art in terms of the art canon, um, I, I feel like that, that conversation is, um, not on, is on shaky ground because of the foundation. What was um, considered by mainly white males what is and what isn't art, and those arguments, those, a, lot of, a lot of parts of the community have been left out, or maybe called outsider artists, things of that nature. So what I'm inspired by, more than I'll say, even though I'm not, it's not excluded, than what's in the art canon is what's outside of it. And in addition to that, in terms of everyday aesthetics, it brings attention, it brings attention to what I would consider the prototype of a certain type of art. And what I mean by that, these things are things that you see that at some point later on becomes theorized, right? And then it's validated, but it's already been there. Where's the origin, right? So what I see in my communities is, are things that I'm inspired by. So I'm just gonna give you some, just show you these images. So you see sculpture, you see installation, you see painting. You see all those, all those conversations. And it doesn't matter if the people know about it or not, it's, it's being done. Black bodies, bodies, architecture, vernacular architecture. So this is, this is a photograph and, and of my work, which is inspired by the previous images. Interventions. Got to read those books. Photographs, and the, the interesting thing about this, this is a, um, a space that I uh, actually did a project with Jamal's right there. I did a sp um, photographs with the space, but the space is of a space of people who made a space. And they play chess in an empty parking lot. So they actually transform an empty parking lot into a space where they play chess. So I thought that was very interesting. Also, to represent them because they are from this neighborhood, so they can see themselves. And then bringing it back around, showing you the inspiration of that work and how my work is also was inside the art space. And um, basically, yeah, it's just a, this information. And then basically, it is a dialectical kind of conversation going back and forth. Uh, what I'm interested in, also, I'm starting to add is a different discussions to give context to my exhibitions or shows or anything like that. And so I think that should be. So, recap. I'm, I'm not going to read all of it. <laughs> I was just really excited. Com components of my practice frames or presents inquiries, concerns, and conditions, particularly issues dealing with people in the community I frequently, I frequent or reside in. And I'll just go down to three. Aesthetics, not merely a measurement of what's beautiful or not beautiful within an art context, but also what it means in a social political context. People's actions as an aesthetic, ephemeral material as aesthetic, the everyday with or without intervention as an aesthetic, collaborations as an aesthetic, all fall under the everyday aesthetic. And as I end, I just want to ask you some questions that 
You don't need to answer, but I just want you to think about it real quick. Okay. Uh, so one is uh, the museum and art world where capital dictates and frames our labels visibility. I want you to uh, ask what causes white flight in the art world? In other words, is there a white spatial imaginary, like I talked about neighborhoods, is that, can it also be considered in the art world, art institutions? Um, yeah, I think that's it. I don't want to get too much in there. I think we'll get into it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Took too long. So, so that was a, that was dense. That was that was a lot of just um, projects that were incredibly complex and required um, just um, collaboration. But I want us to kind of go back to a genesis point, which is really the title of this conversation is really beyond social practice. Um, and I, and I, I want to just start to unpack this idea that, you know, there's a continuum that's happening that's ever evolving from um, a social practice to a studio practice. And, and I'd love for you guys to just think about um, your own process of coming to a social practice. So um, what led you down this path where you sort of uh, claim this term or claim this um, area for yourself, and what did that feel like um, in in this sort of broader art art test, artistic context? So, Shani, can we start with you? Um, yeah, I have a clear answer for that. Um, I first heard the term social practice from um, a really good friend of mine. Now, um, our first meeting was at a studio visit with Petrushka Basin Larson, who really helped to build out that organization that I mentioned, the Laundromat Project. Um, and she um, asked me for a studio visit because the work I was doing was social practice work, but I didn't know it. <laughs> I want to stop you. Yeah, wait, yeah. You didn't know it. No. Right. Okay. So I think that's important, right? Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. like absolutely. Just that wait. Yeah. So um, a bit about my background. I'm, you know, I'm a black person of some privilege. Both of my parents have advanced degrees, and my father's, you know, got a PhD. Um, so we went to museums growing up in Lansing, Michigan, and we traveled a bit, but we didn't go to art museums. And being a contemporary artist of any kind was just nothing that was on my radar, right? Um, and then when I was fortunate enough to like, have my life unfold to where I did learn that this was a thing, to where I did just kind of wiggle my way into it, um, it's been of such benefit to me. Um, you know, aside from the social interaction, just having a studio practice, having um, this space in your life to really give your own imagination such privilege and priority is amazing. It's a thing that I need to be who I am. Um, and I, you know, I just stumbled into it. So I realized at this point in my work that so much of what I do is just like, in the back of my mind is like, would 14 year old me have been able to know about this thing. Like, how do I make sure that 14-year-old me gets to get that? You know what I'm saying? And that's even coming from a space where we were going to something like a museum. So many people are not, you know, coming even as close as I did to like art world adjacent experiences. Yeah, Jen, as, as a person who's supported many artists and, and again created open engagement with this idea of coming together to really expand the conversation, what has your own personal process been like? Well, I feel like in, in my talk, I went over that a little bit, right? Like how the term itself felt all of a sudden inclusive in a way that I hadn't found anything like that before. A lot of the terms that I had listed were all things that felt like clubs that I did not have access to. And also a lot of the precursors that I referenced, those people were not calling themselves social practice artists, right? Like, they were avant-garde artists, they were doing their own thing, they were looking at their own lives and daily existences and figuring out a practice that made sense for them. And I think that coming to the terms that I have been using is about an openness where those things should be able to find a place within that framework, right? 
And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go a little bit further in just saying, I asked you earlier about even the term artist, right? And the complexity of using that term. Can you kind of explain a little bit what, about the sort of conflicts or the feelings that came up about using that term artist? Yeah, I mean, I talk a lot about artist-led and artist-run culture. I don't shy away from that at all. I think it's so important for all of the reasons that I listed, and we're in a project right now, essentially, that shows why that is so significant. But sometimes I don't use that term personally because I feel like it can also create barriers, and that sometimes it's not something that a lot of people feel like they can connect to. And Often I don't want to create that division in the work that I'm doing. Thank you. Nathaniel, how about you in terms of just developing this practice? Mm. When did you d sort of claim this social practice, or have you? I actually don't claim it. I actually think it's a word or a term that we use that's a uh, uh, more universal just for um, sake of communication. Um, what I claim is what I put on that thing there, and, and I do that because, like Jim was saying, in terms of uh, limitations, restrictions, categories, and all of these things, I felt the need to create my own space, uh, de define myself, which allows me fluidity to change at any moment without having a allegiance to a particular uh, power group or a particular um, uh, so-called art world because uh, I think what I'm interested in is life and what I'm interested in is uh, expands, maybe expands the communication. And I know this sounds hypocritical because I think the most artsy thing to say is I'm anti-art, but the thing is I think all of the different things that I'm interested in in terms of collaboration or stepping in outside of those parameters is, um, is more where uh, I feel like the social practice is. In other words, social practice or the idea of social practice or that definition goes beyond its own definition for me. And uh, just to give a little visual short storytelling is that uh, my grandfather, and this is where I, 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 I think I developed just in terms of uh, just interested in all kinds of different things and, and, and helping people so, or whatever. So the, my grandfather, who, who's, who's also from Third Ward, um, uh, when I was younger, like, you know, 10, he would, um, he had his own, like, business. He was maybe, I, I don't think he even finished high school or whatever, and, uh, but he had a business. Um, and that business was, uh, what do you call it, uh, landscaping, right? And so the, the landscaping, um, was the thing about it that was interesting, not just the landscape, and that was interesting that he was able to support himself and he was the, help, helped everybody in our family and, he, and even gave all the guys jobs once they reached like 13, if they wanted to work with him. The thing is that he would help people that were considered un, unable to be helped. So it was like veterans, and these are all people from this neighborhood, veterans, uh, ex-drug uh, dealers, uh, People that were uh, in prison and they, they, they couldn't find jobs. So he was giving them jobs. And so uh, I didn't, you know, and, and like family wise, like every, all of my aunts and everybody was really sweet, but he was really harsh, you know what I mean? He cursed you out and stuff. And, um, but what I, what I gathered from that was that he was, he was about helping people and working with people and, and trying to uh, do something in terms of an aesthetic um, for, for, different places, and, then, and within that you see, and I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna end this because I know I go on tangents, but within that you see, you see all of these art terms in that. You see sculpture, right? Because now they talk about, you know, they talk about landscaping as an art form and also environmental justice. You see um, participatory, you see economic exchange or, or whatever, and you see com community participation, all those things were embedded in that, meaning that those were things that were, again, a prototype for what we now call a certain thing. So I don't really subscribe to that necessarily, but that's not to say I dismiss it. It just says that I'm, I'm interested in other things and I'm interested in identifying myself. So yeah. that's my yeah. answer. 
No, and, and, I, and I think one of the beautiful things about getting um, a group of people together is that we don't all have to have the same answers and experiences, right? And it's important, right, for us to unpack this idea of homogeny because um, you all are operating in different cities with different practices and different um, challenges um, some, and different communities. And, and so I'm, I'm curious, we throw this term out a lot. It comes up um, specifically when we talk about social practice or socially engaged work. And that is that you're working within community. Um, and, and we know that this can be a really blanket term that we don't define and we sometimes leave vague for lots of reasons, but I'm gonna actually ask you all to um, define that for us. Who do you consider, how do you define community? Who do you consider a part of your community? And then the sort of second part of that is, um, what's your process like when you're working in a different community that you don't consider a part of your, your everyday community? So Shani, if you would maybe, maybe share first. Sure. Um... So I'll speak specifically, you know, as much as I can on behalf of um, the black school and the, and the way we're approaching our work. Um, we, like I mentioned, we ground all of our workshops with these questions. What do you love about your community? What do you want to change about your community? As a way of dealing with this sometimes new immediate community that's formed in a classroom space. Right? There are many communities. We're all intersecting in and out of many communities all the time. Um, but we want our work to be grounded in the students' experiences um, for them to feel, again, like agents of their own change, agents of their own um, design of their own space and lives. So how to, to ground things at that place quickly. Right? And so this term that we all already sort of have an idea about, and that always turns into a conversation about, well, what do y'all mean? Like, is it neighborhood? Are we in a neighborhood school where the students all live, or do they come from different places to go to that school? Um, is it a short-term program? Is it a long-term program? Um, so that's open to the student, but it allows us to, to have the, that question. Um, yes, how's that for a beginning to the answer of community? I like it. <laughs> it's, it's complex, right? Yeah. For me, I think uh, community is wherever you engage, wherever you are as a space, and how um, you interact with those other beings in that space, and those other beings interact with you in a bi-directional way in terms of respect and understanding. And um, differences happen, but I think that because, uh, you know, I think like this is a guy who wrote named G Greg Madison wrote a thing. Uh, he, he has this idea called uh, existential migration, and that's just a space that's just like wherever you go, you kind of create your own space, right? And so I don't know if, if community should be a thing where it's like just that one thing, you know, but it's like many things, you know. And I know I'm, I'm talking around, this. but I think community for me is just like wherever you go, and there's like this kind of uh, reciprocity and people and human beings and ideas. Um, I, don't, I don't know if, um, you know, I don't even know, sometimes I wonder if there even is a community, sometimes. You know, what, what does it mean not to have a community? And if, if you don't have a community and all the other people who don't have community, can they formulate a community of not being in one? You know? Jen. There have been a few kind of attempts at definitions of community that I've gravitated towards. One being Giorgio Agamben's idea of the coming community that's similar to what you were saying is a community can be as simple as a group of people that experience something together, some kind of event that you can acknowledge that everyone is coming from different backgrounds, places, geographical, otherwise, but that a community can be experiencing something together. Another kind of idea of community is also connected to what you were saying about like, is there even a community? And Anderson's thought of like imagined communities that you might never meet the people that are connected to you. And he uses this example of reading the newspaper, that that's actually a community. Everyone that reads the newspaper that day is part of a community. 
And then I think the one that I think about the most and maybe resonate with the most is Michael Warner's idea of publics and counterpublics, and that the important part about that is that a public is self-identified. And I think that that is very important, being able to really name that you are part of something and feel comfortable and have agency in that. You know? And then in terms of the communities that I feel like I work in, I mean, it varies like with all of us from project to project, from the different spaces that we occupy. But with open engagement, at least, like I was really seeing that as a whole ecology of people involved in doing this work. And in, in trying to create that space, wanting the space to kind of embody the kind of community that I wish that I was seeing in the art world. And thinking about Lisa's presentation and all of the breakdowns, it's very important for us that that site was anti-racist, anti-capitalist, femi feminist, accessible, and that the demographics broke down, that it was a you know, minority majority space. And that's just not the way that you would see things represented in most of the art worlds that we understand. And so that sort of like shaping community was very important. Yeah, thank you guys. Gia, can I circle back to the second part of the question? Yeah, absolutely. I didn't really answer that. Um, uh, because it's also like very present in, in life right now. Becoming a parent has adjusted um, the ways I work in terms of physical location and working with other communities, right? So how do we decide um, who we're gonna work with, when and where? Um, and it's, so the first part of this is that before I had a kid, I could go wherever I want, right? And it's a, a very real reality that um, we as artists are typically underpaid, but there are some perks, like you might not get paid a lot to come do this work, but you get a plane ticket and you get to go to see the world, right? And this is how we see a lot of these problematic projects where it feels like somebody's dropping in, right? People want this perk of traveling because it's an amazing human experience that we should all be so fortunate to experience, right? Um, so I have had the opportunity to um, do some travel and to take projects into other spaces and see how that functions. And I can see that that can happen in an honorable way and I can see how it cannot happen in an honorable way. Um, but with having a child, um, you just got to prioritize things. And the way that um, we're really working to do that right now is to, um, even in New York, be a bit more local, work in Harlem, spend less time on the train because nobody's paying for our daycare, right? <laughs> um, so it's like we brought the Black Love Festival to Harlem this year and we hope to stay with that institution and we're doing a workshop series with that institution in between time. Um, and then uh, pursuing opportunities to work in the spaces where our families are, because we know we'll be there, because we know our child needs to see her grandparents, you know, and we know that there'll be reason for sustained engagement, especially with a project like a school, right? This is the sort of project that you do need to have some roots um, for it to be truly meaningful. Yeah, so, you know, I know I'm asking somewhat going back and forth between like kind of really complex com you know um, concepts that we all have different definitions for and then very basic questions like who do you consider a part of your community um, I feel like this is a learning opportunity for all of us um, and so having you all be able to share vulnerably and honestly is just so incredibly important and I want to just acknowledge that um, be, to sort of demystify, right, the, the process and practice of artists that are working so that we can better value um, their contributions. Um, and so that kind of leads me to the question of if you're not rooted in the commodification of object, right, um, how do you make money? How do you sustain yourselves? Um, what are some of the models and or um, strategies that you've used and how can we uh, as audience, public, advocate, etc., better understand uh, what some of those needs are? I'm, gonna give them a second. I, 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 I'm the wrong person to ask. I need to talk to Ms. Dent on all of this. I, I will defer. Training. You know, I, I think I do the typical stuff. You know the grants and uh, you know I, I, and I, I sell work on a commercial kind of thing 
um, sometimes. And uh, I, I mean, that's, I think too, because I'm in Houston, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's probably is not as difficult. Not that I sell work to people in Houston, but being located in Houston, I think it gives me a little more space, you know, and um, plus, you know, you know I, my wife helps, helps out a lot. And so, uh, you know, it, it, that, that's kind of, I mean, that's the only way I can answer it. I mean, it, it's up and down. Um, it's all like, I mean, you I teach? No, I don't. Really? I do not teach. That was a lecture you just gave us. <laughs> so I'm a very skeptical person, but since I know Shiny, I know that wasn't a diss. Because <laughs> that could be taken. It was a, I, I know, I'm just. Talking. Yeah, yeah. I felt like you might have like modified a classroom. Yeah, because it was, it was well composed. It was not a diss. Yeah, like that too, sure. <laughs> um, so I teach, um, I have taught before, um, before doing this um, school art project um, and apply for grants and all of the things, um, but I certainly do not make enough money. Um, this is another thing that is getting clarified with becoming a parent um, and, um, you know, Becoming a parent and the convergence of um, this project, the Black School, are they're very related. Um, there are some, and I should say that the um, original concept is Joseph's. This was something he was thinking about before we met. I always had a dream in the back of my head about starting something like this, so it was something that we really immediately bonded over. Um, but he, you know, it's important to combine different thinking and approaching approaches, and he's just so much more direct than me in some ways, um, and there are some really great direct things about an art project that's a school, that's a social practice project, right? It erases these questions about like, what is the artist making and what are the publics making and is the artist taking credit, right? It's, it's a simple format that we as a society kind of already have an understanding of, and within that, the format of a person teaching a class and being paid a wage to do that is also something that we as a society um, acknowledge. So that's a thing that we're able to hold institutions accountable to. And then with the presence of this precious little child, <laughs> really shame people about like, we're spending this much classroom time and we need to be compensated for that. Um, beyond institutional um, um, dependence, self-determination is a long-term goal of life and is embedded within our sort of visionary thinking for the black school and um, a thing that we're looking into um, that we're really launching in the next year is an arm of programming um, called the black studio um, Joseph has a background in graphic design um, and does a lot of the the design work for um, things that you see um, so the idea is to build out a, a design studio that can um, take for profit work from paying customers, that can go back into paying for programming, um, and that also creates an employment um, trajectory for our former students, because this is another thing that we um, deal with in teaching art to populations of color, of historically oppressed populations. People need to make real money, right? So um, a design studio is a sort of tangible way that you can exercise a creative life. Um, so that's a long-term way of sustaining that we're working on. Jen, in your experience of both your sort of personal practice, but then in also, again, like hosting um, convenings where lots of people are grappling with this issue, what are, you, what are you hearing as some of the strategy? Well, I will say that the question around sustainability and these practices is very real, you know? And because of the fact that a lot of it isn't market driven. A lot of artists doing this work are reliant on institutions and funders to support them. And I think that can be very dangerous for a lot of reasons because a lot of those funders are setting up the rules of engagement, right? And determining who is able to do this work and why they might be doing the work. And I think that we need to think about what are, what are other ways that we can be more accountable to the artists doing this work and support them, you know. 
And I think it can look a lot of different ways. I think that there are artists who are trying to figure out systems for their own projects that are self-sustaining, that are maybe looking to other models that don't rely on receiving grants. I know for a lot of the work that I've done, it has been about being resourceful. It has been about different members of the community and different organizations pooling the resources that they do have and using them creatively to support doing this. But I, it's just, it's not enough. And I think that we all want to see this work continue, but don't necessarily have the answers. And, and I want to point out, I think because um, Lisa so appropriately pointed out the kind of burnout, right? And the burnout being real, both for arts workers and artists and cultural workers. Um, and, and this idea that, um, you know, gig economy is, is really important to artists, right? Having the opportunity to work in hospitality or work in education on the side of doing something else and to try to kind of create one's own formula for sustainability. Um, the reuse of materials seems like another way that artists are constantly thinking about ways to keep costs down, but still, um, you know, live their values through their work. Um, are, there, are there other strategies that you all have seen or models or um, that you think are interesting, provocative ways that we should be pushing our energy towards? <laughs> it's a difficult question. I mean, I, I shared our, um, our working model vision for that, um, but it's absolutely still a vision until we get there. Um, but you know, that's important to acknowledge also. Um, I find so many times, let me try to collect these thoughts. Um, like this tent within the institution. So many times I feel like our work is just intersecting with, is this metaphor for black life in America in general, right? We are a different sort of citizenry um, and we're always functioning in this sort of apart space with these long-term goals um, and this current reality, you know? Um, so it's, it's a process of negotiating your current reality um, on the way to something else. Um, and a process of figuring out how to use the resources that are actually available to you in that current, current reality to build towards um, something that feels truer and better. I, I knew this was a hard question. <laughs> I, knew this, I knew this was a difficult question. One that, again, is like we are working through like together. And, and part of the reason why I brought this up is you, you use the word negotiation, right? And I think that um, artists in general, but in particular um, in dealing with social practice are, are being asked to be disruptors and interventionists and organizers and developers and educators and, and leaders in lots of different realms. And I bring this up because um, those of us who've ever had to write a grant um, or to sort of lead a project we like to use this, these terms, right? Because they're really sexy for funders and, and they sound really good. Um, but I, but I, I bring it back to you guys because these are, these are actually other roles, right? These are, these are, this is value add, this is additional labor. And I wonder how you negotiate this additional labor um, with institutions, with funders, with stakeholders, with community members. I, oh. I got really hard questions for okay. you right this, now. Okay, this is, this, is, this is something I think a way in terms of like, I guess a model, not a motto, but uh, the potential uh, for the first question. And I think Eureka has a good idea, but so I think it's not an immediate result, but I think if there's a way, because I think this, this whole economic thing rolls back around, I think everything rolls back around to politics. And so I think that if um, artists were able to, as a collective, uh, engage in politics in a way that forces politicians or the systems to see value in what artists do 
and also think about co collecting uh, numbers in terms of putting pressure on um, politicians to advocate for different systems that supply uh, money, monies, or um, are inst instilling maybe um, a, a, a format or something, I, I, I don't know the correct word, but something that uh, is, uh, that um, rewards those who are doing certain things that are not necessarily marketable. And uh, like, the, like the idea of fun we have in Houston, like if that will could be, could be amplified you know, more, that, that may help. But I think connecting with politics, and when I say politics, I don't mean like, you know, oh, you're a Democrat or a liberal or whatever. I don't necessarily mean that. But I think the, 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 the problem will come. I think the problem gonna come if you, if you did that is like the whole idea of capitalism. Like if you get caught up in the money thing, and I think, I think everybody kind of alluded to it, you, 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 people begin to feel like they own you, you know, once, once they start putting money into it. So I think, however, that can be resolved or, you know, explored could be a way to do it. And then, um, what is this? I can't even read my writing. That's, that's the, I don't even know if this, I'm sorry, I don't know what this goes. Okay, I, I think, like, so like, like something what Shani and her partner is doing, like in terms of like re-educating people about uh, like in a serious way, not in a very, like not in a, you know, trendy way. Oh, it's cool, let's re-educate. Not like that, but like a really serious way on um, um, how, like how artists should, should, should work, but uh, how, how like people who we look to uh, and find other spaces that are not necessarily connected. Like, yeah, you got collectors, but then you have other people who are, um, who may have, uh, interest in, in maybe not what art is, but just like supporting something. And if, if there's a way or maybe creating a hub or maybe a website or some kind of way to find those people, you know, and then connect those people to the cause, then that, that may be a way. This is, I just thought, I mean, I, it, I'm a slow, you know, I, it takes me a long time to think of stuff, so I, I probably have it like next week maybe. But <laughs> that's what I got right now. I'm gonna to respond to both those questions together. For me, it isn't so much about one model that I can point to that I think is exemplary, but I think there are many strategies, and one of those strategies is seeing existing energies and opportunities, and as artists, being able to insert yourself into those and allowing our work to be carried for a while, you know? And unfortunately, because of the fact that I think funding is so scarce that we really do need to find those openings or create them or you know, bring the folding chair with us everywhere in hopes that we're able to be supported in some way. And I think we need to be open to that looking a very different way. And I think Public Matters, that group in LA I brought up, you know, a lot of their work was funded from organizations that had nothing to do with art. And that's like part of the beauty of the expansiveness of this way of working. And then with the, the latter part about how do you get to be valued as all these other things, I'm still trying to do the work and a lot of us are engaged in the work of just having art culture and society value artists as artists. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I'll work on that one first and then I'll move on to how do you value us as an artist and a developer and an organizer and a facilitator and all of those well, okay. plus ends. Yes. Okay, not, I'm not, so like the whole, see that goes back to like the language, you know what I'm saying? Like, the language of art, like the word art, and how that word, like y'all you know, were saying, like could be elitist, like when people look at it. But then, you know, how the word could, you know how people now call people who, who do social work, like the, the, the ultra-right or alt-right call people social justice workers in the derogatory connotation, you know what I mean? So it's like almost like the word art, artists, fall somewhere near that, like, you know, artists, you know, get away, you know? So I think, like, even, redef not redefining the word, but, like, how we present, the language and how we present, you know, as a, as a response. Shani, any, any ideas, thoughts? Oh, I thought I already answered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I started to, 
I started to have a thought around language, but yeah, I don't think it's necessarily answering the question. Yeah, it's fine. It's, it would be a tangent. This is a day of, <laughs> of posing questions. That's really what we're doing. We're posing lots of questions. Um, so it, kind of around final thoughts, I guess I'm really curious because again, we don't know everyone who's sort of in, in the audience um, and I always like to give creatives a space to talk about their needs. Um, and so I'm just going to ask you all to, to share, you know, right now, what is, what is your most pressing need? And, and if someone heard this and wanted to be responsive to you, how would they, how would they get in contact with you to actually support you in getting the thing that you needed? Um, so Nathaniel, I'm going to start with Too you. Too long list. So I'll just get my website. Is it most pressing? Well, well, so like I did the, uh, like I was talking about the, not that, but this website. So just to clarify that, that website is not like me writing, like it's me, it's me inviting writers and uh, people to write reviews or, you know, experimental writing, all those things. But I pay... You know, I mean, I do a little writing there, but mostly it's other people who, who write well and know what they're doing, you know. I, I pay people to, to, to do that. I, it's, I don't ask anyone, that's why it's, I didn't, I'm sorry to mention it's like quarterly, and sometimes it's like half a year or something, depending on finances. So I don't, I don't, I ask people to submit or whatever, I invite people, whatever, and I pay those people, you know. But now it's been like I'm paying out of pocket. So, that would probably be my most immediate need because I think the bigger picture for me is not just talking about me, but the, all those different voices on that platform being able to, you know, share and them also being able to be comp compensated. So that would be like my, you know. So being able to pay other artists is a pressing writers. need right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Isn't these well, my website, artists give the most? I got, I got like, to get my website. Oh, sure. Yeah. Just Google my name <laughs> and it'll come up. Everything comes up. You don't, I'm the only one. Just Google it. I'm the only one. The only one. I'm the only uh, black. Other artists, like we're more concerned and more generous in paying other artists than the institutions with the long money who should actually be paying us. Like coming out of pocket to pay other artists. I'm familiar with that reality. Um, I have two answers. The first one is daycare. And it's funny because I just submitted a grant application <laughs> uh, to an organization that offers $5,000 grants to parent artists that they can use on whatever. So cross your fingers. I guess my ask for that is cross your fingers that we get that. Also, thank you for this question. It's a very practical question that I really appreciate. Um, and second, um, as we um, build out this black school studio, um, the thing that we need to make it work is clients, is paying clients. So if you're an organization um, that values um, paying minority-owned businesses, um, that values supporting um, education projects, youth education projects, community education projects, um, please um, get in touch with us. Um, we're launching with the Bronx Museum of Arts, who um, I've taught with for years, and I really appreciate um, a lot of their sort of core values. So they'll, they'll be our first official clients, and yeah, I invite anyone to, to, to jump on board. Um, our website is theblack.school. Our email address is theblackschoolnyc at gmail. Thank you. I think it would be very easy for me to say that one of the most pressing needs is funding for this work for you know, not only myself, but for artists who are also trying to support other artists. I think another need that I have is institutional change and wanting to be let in to those processes to be able to affect that kind of institutional change. And it's hard to be let into those leadership positions and roles to make that kind of change. And I feel like it mostly does, unfortunately, happen at those levels. And then I think the last need I have is something that I, I hope to have the ability to do for myself, but that is to be able to define what success is for me and my projects as an individual and to hold that up and feel 
good about it and not to measure the success and worth of my projects by these standards that are out there, you know, because it's very easy to sometimes feel like the work has failed because it doesn't get funded or because you can't figure out a way maybe to pay people the way you want to or to be with your core values as best you can. And so I think to be able to set up a situation in which I can succeed in that way and feel good about it is important. Thank you, and thank you all for staying with us and listening. I just, I wanna leave us, I'm gonna, I'm gonna butcher these numbers, but, I, but the, the sentiment I think is important, which is that the NEA did a study, um, and they, they return to this sort of um, information pretty regularly, where they poll Americans about their relationship to the arts and how many people support the arts. Um, and it's always up there in the 90s that, you know, 90 to 95% of the people in this country support the arts. Um, and they asked the same question of um, how many people support artists, and the number pretty consistently stays at about 25%, right? And so um, I leave us with this idea that, um, you know, we, I think we've echoed throughout this conversation today, which is just that the people, right? Uh, the people who are doing this work are valuable and therefore need to have the resources to continue to contribute to um, our communities, however we define them. Um, so I'd like to just uh, thank the artists who shared really openly and honestly today, and I'm gonna encourage you that if you have a resource or know of a resource that you share that with them, um, as we just continue to connect and continue to have this dialogue uh, continue. I'd also just love to thank uh, Project Row Houses and Eureka and Ryan for just being thought leaders, um, being willing to have these conversations. Um, they are difficult and challenging, and the rest of the team that um, you know, does all this invisible work to make sure that uh, we all look good and feel good. Um, and just thanks to the Third Ward community and to Houston, so thank you all. So we have actually gone over time a little bit, but I have um, space for three questions, quick questions. If you have, ooh, Q, okay, he jumped out his seat. Hi, my name is Q. I'm a student at the University of Houston. Um, I noticed that one thing we didn't address throughout um, the symposium was how do we also hold educational institutions accountable? for the impacts that they have on students as they're going through their BFA program. Because I know, as I was going through my BFA program in painting, one thing that I felt like I wasn't given was the business acumen, um, the skills necessary to succeed as an artist, like post-grad. And so I had to go out and get a business minor on my own. Um, so my question is, how do I hold collegiate institutions accountable for educations? Um, curriculums for students, and then how can I have a agency in changing these curriculums? <laughs> Sorry, one last part, and then what is your advice for me? Uh, what is your advice for me as a student um, looking to institute these changes to make it better for the students behind me? Yeah, that's uh, it's a great question. One, I'll say that I definitely am holding educational institutions accountable for the education that they provide and personally have been making those sorts of changes at every institution that I've been at. I think part of it is about, you know, when you're a student, you actually have so much power and agency, I think more than students realize, and that is not something that is promoted, you know, at the institution. Like, if you speak up, change will happen. But truthfully, if you speak up, change will happen, you know? And I think, you know, you have to be involved in all the different processes that affect the kind of institutional change that you're asking for. A lot of that has to do with having the right people at those institutions who are going to advocate for that change and to make that happen and help shepherd it along. Because if you have people who are teaching at a school who don't believe in those core values, it will be harder. You know, and students can be involved in those hiring processes and can speak up and, you know, be agents of change in that way. And I think you can hold your own instructors accountable. I ask my students to do that with me 
all the time. I also ask them to take assessments of the curriculum that they are being taught in other classes. I ask them how many people of color are being represented in those classes. You know, what are the things that you are reading? Who is being put into the canon? Who is being excluded? And if you have a problem with that, you take it to the administration and you point that out and things will change. I just wanted to thank everybody here and the hard work uh, sitting here looking around at the El Dorado Ballroom as one of the early volunteers at Row Houses, you know, when it was uh, boarded up. Um, and I appreciate there was at least one other former executive director from along the way. Uh, I think one, it's important important not only for artists to admit struggle, but, you know, art workers to admit struggle. And uh, people may not widely understand that there were efforts within the first 10 years to form the Project Rural House Foundation to allow people from Houston to travel to other places. And I particularly went to LA in the Watts Tower area to kind of see how to uh, kind of affect change in the same ways that Houston did uh, there. And uh, that, that foundation fell by the wayside, mainly because it was going to be uh, donor driven, to a single donor to uh, help do that. And when that got, the, the plug got pulled on that, you know, it went by the wayside. And so, uh, I just wanted to kind of comment that some of the structures that exist now in talking about new industry, new forms of thinking about disrupted industries and the comments that happen in journalism and technology, you know, also apply in the art world. And the structures that evolve to finance and to have empowered workers be recognized and valued for their history of contribution and their invisible presence to actually have things happen uh, can, can move and can affect change. So as a former volunteer, art worker, executive director at the 10-year mark, you know, I am very thankful for the shoulders of the neighborhood that we stand and in this beautiful place, and the donor who uh, gave it to us for the back taxes we paid on it, and all of the labor and work that goes into allowing discourse to happen. So my simple question to everybody is, who voted in November 2016, and who's going to vote this November? 2016, because we have had the privilege of being here for a day and a half uh, as art workers, but really um, the, the labor foregone for me is going out and registering voters who weren't available in 2016. So, uh, you know, we have our work cut out for us in a month and a half, everybody, and uh, get out there figure out what district you should be voting in and bring three new voters along with you. Thank you all so much.